Hi everybody and welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Uh, as many of my students are aware, we held our first lecture for this class live over Big Blue Button, but I wanted to make future lectures pre-recorded at least the majority of them pre-recorded, because I realized that with this COVID-19 situation, some of you are probably still in different time zones, and some of you have reached out to me in regards to scheduling conflicts as well. So this way, everybody can watch the lecture uh, at a time that suits them. So you can watch it when it goes up at 10.05 a.m., uh, that's Eastern Time, of course, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or you can watch it later when it fits your schedule. It's up to you. Now, during the intro lecture, I covered all of the stuff in the course outline that I thought it was important to draw your attention to, so I'm not going to be talking about that stuff today. Today, rather, we're going to be getting into Chapter 1 of Andy Clark's book, and that is, of course, Mindware, 2nd Edition. So if you haven't picked this book up already, please do so. You can get it at the Campus Bookstore on the Carleton University campus, or uh, you can also find it on Amazon, uh, and it's available at other retailers as well. But it's very important to get that book. I mentioned um, a few things that I wanted to draw your attention to from Clark's introduction, um, and we'll be, we'll be mentioning those a little bit in this lecture as well. We'll be coming back to some of those things, particularly ideas concerning um, substance monism and substance dualism. And I'll go over those terms again, you know, before we get too deep into the lecture so that everybody's clear about uh, what those terms mean. So this is really the first of four lectures. Uh, the, the first two chapters in Clark's book deal with um, an idea called computationalism. Computationalism is, if you'd like, uh, or at least it was initially, the um, dominant paradigm of classical cognitive science. Now I'm using this word paradigm very loosely um, because as I mentioned in our live lecture, it's possible that cognitive science is a pre-paradigmatic science, which means, without getting too deep into the philosophy of science, that we still haven't quite worked out what methodologies and so on and so forth what theoretical tools really define what we do as cognitive scientists. That is why some people speak of cognitive sciences, not cognitive science, as I mentioned in the uh, live introductory lecture. So, we're talking about computationalism, and computationalism is, on the one hand, this idea that cognition, that is thinking, perceiving, so on and so forth, computation is cognition, or cognition is computation. They're one in the same. Moreover, according to computationalism, the mind is a computer, because cognition is what the mind-brain does. Um, so, if cognition is computation, well, computation is what the mind-brain does, and that makes the mind-brain like a natural computer. Not like a natural computer, it is a natural computer. Now for today, I'm going to be covering the sketches section of this chapter, where I'll be sketching out all of this important theoretical stuff following Clark's, uh, kind of the narrative Clark spells out in the chapter. I'll be spelling all of that out, and we'll be leaving the discussion uh, sections of the chapter for our Thursday lecture. So we're only really covering the first half of this chapter today, as well as the end of the chapter, actually. So we're actually going to begin by looking at section 1.3, a diversion. Uh, that's from ch chapter 1 of Clark's book. And this is an excerpt from a short story by Terry Bisson called uh, Alien Nation. Oftentimes you find uh, excerpts from this story, the, expert, the excerpt in particular that is quoted at length in Clark's book, you find this online under the title of They're Made of Meat. You're welcome to read it in the book. But you can also check out this short film that somebody made out of Bisson's story called They're Made Out of Meat. I've got a link down here. I want you to take a look at this. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a funny little sketch that highlights some of the interesting issues that we're going to confront in this chapter. And 
Although I understand why Clark leaves it for the end, I think perhaps for our purposes it would be better for you to have watched it before we actually dive into the first section, that is the sketches section of this chapter. So, what you should all do now is stop this video, read section 1.3 from Clark, or even better, click the link below and check out this short film made based upon Bisson's short story, uh, They're Made Out of Meat, from Alien Nation. All right, and then when you get back, we'll dive into chapter one. All right, so now that you've all read or watched They're Made Out of Meat, we're ready to start talking about Meat Machines, which is, of course, the title of the first chapter in Clark's book. Clark starts this chapter off with a quote from the influential computer scientist Marvin Minsky, who described the human brain as a quote-unquote meat machine. Of course, this is a very materialist position. Remember from our introductory lecture, I mentioned briefly that often in philosophy of mind and cognitive science, or rather the philosophy of cognitive science, we come upon these different metaphysical positions um, regarding what the mind is, whether the mind or the mental is this separate mental substance, you know, like Rene Descartes thought. Rene Descartes was a philosopher who believed that there was res extensa, that is extended substance, you know, physical stuff, matter and energy. Uh, and then there was also res cogitans, thinking substance, the mind, uh, the soul, essentially. If we think of the brain as a meat machine, or the mind as a meat machine, like Minsky does, that's a very materialist position, which is, uh, you know, much, much different than substance dualism. In fact, it's a variety of what we would call substance monism. Substance monism posits that there is one kind of stuff, where substance dualism posits that there's two kinds of stuff. On substance monism, the only stuff that exists is the physical, uh, at least in the kind of substance monism that we're talking about in this lecture. Uh, and usually this kind of monism is called uh, physicalism or materialism. We're going to call it materialism because that's the term that Clark uses. Now, according to this materialist position, all of our thoughts, feelings, memories, experiences, um, everything in the mind uh, is really due to the workings of the brain. That is to say, all your memories, all your experiences, all your emotions, um, all those aspects of your conscious mental life are, uh, in some way, the product of this meat machine in your skull. And remember, um, we're talking about a particular slant of materialism here. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, it's called computationalism, the view that the mind is a computer. Not that the mind is like a computer or analogous to a computer. It is a computer by virtue of what it does. And we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly the mind brain does as we continue through this chapter. Now, because of this metaphysical position of, uh, you know, naturalism or physicalism or materialism or whatever you want to call it that we're taking here on the one hand, and on the other hand, because of computationalism, that is the view that the mind is a computer, Taken together, these two positions suggest that the mind is best studied naturalistically, of course, right? We can study the mind with a science. We can do cognitive science. That's great. But an important thing to keep in mind is that what is important to cognitive scientists and philosophers most of the time here when we talk about this stuff is not what the brain is actually made of, but rather how the system is organized, how it works, and as we'll see, how information flows through that system. As we'll see as we proceed through this lecture and encounter ideas like functionalism, we'll begin to get a sense of the way in which what matters is not the stuff something is made of, but how it functions, right? So we could make a computer out of whatever, really, right? We can make digital computers out of plastic and silicon and metal and things like that. We could perhaps make a, another meat machine similar to the human brain, made out of meat, uh, just like the humans 
in their made out of meat were made out of. Uh, we can make computers uh, perhaps out of uh, gears like the early programmable computers. The earliest programmable computer, in fact, was uh, invented by, I believe it was the English mathematician Charles Babbage, uh, and it was made out of uh, gears and switches and these kinds of things. We could make them out of vacuum tubes. We could make a computer out of water clocks or something. There's many, many different ways we can make computers, right? What matters is not what they are made out of. Rather, what matters is what they do. But, of course, as I say here on slide three, this is not just um, unmistakable materialism. This is also a rejection of substance dualism, right? Of course, on substance dualism, we have these two different kinds of substances, mind and matter. And um, the matter is physical, it's extended, it takes up space. Mind is non-physical and doesn't take up space and is responsible for conscious experience. Uh, this isn't a philosophy of mind class, so we don't really have time to dive deeply into the problems that this raises, but it does raise a number of quite intractable problems, which is why we're not really paying very serious attention to it here. Now, before I move on, I just want to take a quick look at box 1.1, the first little box in chapter 1. This box is entitled The Same Machine. You find these little boxes sprinkled throughout Clark's writing, which is actually really handy because in these boxes, Clark explains important terms and ideas uh, that in some, in some senses he glosses over in the main body of the chapter. So I want to pay close attention to these boxes. And the first one talks about in what sense a brain, a meat machine, and a digital computer are the same. I mentioned earlier that the, what matters here, the sameness that matters, is not what the machine is made out of, but the function it performs. Or, if you like, the functional description it satisfies. Earlier I said we could make computers out of uh, many different things. On, on this uh, slide here, where I'm talking about box 1.1, the example I use is a pocket calculator, right? A pocket calculator is one type of calculator. But I can make another type of calculator out of uh, beads and wires and wood, and that would be an abacus, right? And I could calculate on an abacus, uh, similar to how I can calculate on a pocket calculator. So, in this sense, we can say that a calculator is multiply realizable. This idea of multiple realizability is very important in philosophy of mind and philosophy of cognitive science. And it's related to an idea known as functionalism. Functionalism is the idea that we understand what things are in terms of their functions. And that's what I've been talking about so far with respect to the meat machine in our skulls being a computer and this laptop, which is made of plastic and silicon and metal, being a computer. They're both computers because they both perform the same functions. They compute. And computation, well, there are a number of different definitions of computation, but... For the moment, it should suffice to say that computation is information processing. But I won't say too much more about it, because that's also what the next three lectures are for. So I don't want to get ahead of myself too, too far. So, um, if, if, if one function, like computation, can be realized, that is implemented, using different physical stuff, a meat machine versus metal and silicon and plastic versus the wood and wires of an abacus or something, we say that it is multiply realizable, okay? So this is the sense in which a meat machine and a, um, you know, another kind of computing machine like a digital computer are the same. They are the same because functionally they are both information processors. They're both computers. Um, and as a result, we can say that computers are multiply realizable. In fact, different kinds of computers that perform different kinds of tasks are multiply realizable. And not just computers. Um, you know, we have artificial hearts nowadays, too. So we could say that the heart is multiply realizable, right? I could have my natural heart, or I could have an artificial mechanical heart and be a cyborg or something. Now, I should mention that not everyone agrees with this idea, right? Um, a vocal critic of this kind of thing is the philosopher John Searle. 
and we'll probably encounter his ideas in more detail as we proceed. So I'm not going to go too far down that John Searle rabbit hole today. But just know that not every philosopher of mind agrees with this stuff, okay? Now, uh, this meat machine analogy may seem a little crude, or maybe even a little humorous, you know, if you enjoyed the short film that you watched. But it's also quite powerful. We'll see some of the ways in which it is powerful in the rest of this chapter and in the following chapter. But for now, what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that this machine analogy, this meat machine of Minsky's, this analogy is part of a long history of machine analogies when it comes to the mind. So Clark points out in chapter one that the human mind has been compared to all kinds of different mechanical devices. Really, whatever mechanical devices were in vogue at the time, the mind has been compared to. In the early modern period, the mind would be compared to, for example, clockwork mechanisms, automata, things of that nature. In the early 20th century, the mind was often compared to a telephone switchboard. Nowadays, the mind is compared oftentimes to a digital computer. So these machine analogies actually uh, go quite a ways back into history. Um, in fact, I will be delivering a seminar uh, in the winter semester at Carleton University on this exact topic. Um, so, if I happen to make those videos available uh, when the time comes on YouTube, then I invite you all to check them out. Now, this view of the mind as a machine is powerful because it gives us a way to relate the mental and the physical together without the mysteries of dualism. I didn't want to talk too much about dualism here, but in dualism, we have a pretty classic problem, the mind-body interaction problem. Basically, it results from this, you know, dualism positing that there are two different substances. We have res extensa, or matter, which is physical, takes up space, you know, obeys the laws of physics, so on and so forth. And then we have this non-physical mind, this spirit stuff. Okay, cool. But how do they interact? How does information, physical information, uh, travel through my sensory organs and create an experience in this non-material mind of mine. How does that work? How does my mind, which according to dualism is non-material, control my body, which is material? How does that work? So that's the mind-body interaction problem. And that's just one example of the you know, the way in which dualism kind of uh, creates more problems than it solves, or more questions than it answers. An alternative to dualism is that we think of uh, what Clark is calling mindware as something that's in the brain, in the same way that uh, the software that a computer runs is in the computer. It's run on the uh, wetware of the brain, if you like. And Clark writes on pages 8 and 9 that such a view provides a ready-made answer to a profound puzzle. How to get sensible, reason-respecting behavior out of a hunk of physical matter, right? Uh, ultimately, I'm just made of matter. I'm a meat machine. How do I do all of this if I'm just made of meat, right? Think back to the little uh, film you just watched. How do, I, how do I think if I'm just made of meat? How do I talk if I'm just made of meat? I use my meat for thinking and talking and moving, but how does that work? It seems very mysterious. But actually, uh, this meat machine analogy can give us a very powerful way to explain how meat <laughs> is able to do all of this crazy mental stuff. But to really appreciate the power of um, this meat machine analogy to, um, to explain the mental, we need a little bit more of a background in the history of artificial intelligence. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at today. Now, one of the key developments, uh, key for us here in a, this class, in this chapter that is, is the development of formal logics. That is... Um, formal logical systems. We're not going to get our, you know, hands into this too much today. 
Uh, we're not going to be doing any logic in this class, don't worry about that. But we are going to try and gain some appreciation for why formal systems are so important for cognitive scientists. Formal logic, uh, formal logical systems express laws of reason or norms for proper reasoning, and that's very important. And there are many key figures here to go through when it comes to modern logic that have all played some role or another in the development of cognitive science. There was Blaise Pascal, the famous mathematician, also a philosopher, known for Pascal's wager in philosophical circles. Uh, there was Gottfried Leibniz, the co-discoverer of calculus, along with Isaac Newton, and whose system of notation in calculus we still use to this day. There's also Boole. You've heard of Boolean stuff, right? Um, there was Gottlob Frege, who was the father of modern logic, um, who really brought logic into the present uh, and, you know, probably gave it its most substantial update since Aristotle. So Frege is very important, also a very big figure in mathematics. Now, there was uh, Bertrand Russell, the mathematician and philosopher who, along with his colleague Alfred North Whitehead, tried to show that mathematics was grounded in logic and did a lot of work in set theory. Now, we don't have time to go through the contributions of all of these figures. Uh, that would be an entire class in onto itself. But what I do want to draw your attention to are these laws of reason or norms of proper reasoning that, logi uh, that logicians have discovered and applied in their formal systems. These systems are governed by these laws or norms, indeed. Uh, these are sets of legal moves that you can make within the system for transforming, you know, uh, certain expressions written in logic into other expressions. Formal logical systems are also uh, interesting for cognitive scientists because they use symbols to express propositions, right? So um, in propositional logic, I could use uh, one symbol like P or Q to stand for an entire proposition. A proposition, by the way, is a sentence or a statement about the world uh, that has a truth value, right? So it can be true or false. So, you know, it's raining today is a proposition. It's a statement about the world, and it can be true or false. Uh, it happens to be false right now as I record this video. It is not, in fact, raining here in Ottawa, Ontario at this time. So, so we can use symbols to express entire propositions, or we can use like predicate calculus if we want to, and we can express parts of propositions with different symbols. Like I could say something like, Josh is tall. In formal uh, logic and pro uh, predicate calculus, perhaps I could just say, you know, uh, J is T. Those could be my uh, variables that represent certain parts of that proposition, right? So we use these symbols in logic uh, to express propositions, and we can manipulate these symbols according to rules, right? And these rules are the rules of proper reasoning, the norms that govern how we can transform one set of symbols into another set of symbols. Now, the really crazy thing about formal logics is that as long as you follow the rules, truth is preserved. We therefore say that, uh, you know, complete, well-defined, you know, logical systems, uh, they respect reason. They are reason-respecting. They are truth-preserving. If you have true premises and you follow the rules in the argument, it's impossible to have a false conclusion, right? That's the beauty of formal logic. I'll just try to make this a little bit more concrete with an example, like a very simple example, because I promised you we weren't actually going to do any logic. But just take an example like modus ponens, right? Which is a logically valid form of inference. I'll put, um, I'll put a picture of a modus ponens uh, thing somewhere here. But modus ponens uh, says, if P, then Q. That's a logically valid form of inference. So if P is true, Q is necessarily true. And I can make 
you know, whatever, uh, I can make these uh, P's and Q's stand for whatever propositions I would like. So the point is, is I could plug in uh, propositions. Instead of P and Q, I could have sentences in there that say things about the world. And as long as those propositions are true, and if they have this format, if P then Q, then my conclusion Q must be true if my premise is true. If you think about it, Formal logical systems are a little bit like Ikea furniture. So you're, you're not a carpenter. Maybe you're moving into a new place or a residence or something for a university and you've got yourself a bunch of Ikea furniture. You're not a carpenter, but if you follow those instructions that came with your Ikea furniture, well, you'll end up with the correct piece of furniture, hopefully. So formal logics are a little bit like this. Um, even if you're ignorant of the meaning of the symbols, you know, even if we don't give a, assign any meaning to P or Q or any of the variables that we use in our logical expressions, if we follow the rules for transforming those expressions into other expressions, we'll get a logically valid answer. We'll get an answer that preserves the truth. Even if we are completely ignorant of or blind to what the symbols themselves actually stand for. Perhaps we can break this down and make it a little bit clearer uh, by taking a look at box number two in chapter one. Uh, a box number two deals with the distinction between syntax and semantics. So we have two different kinds of properties. We have semantic properties and we have syntactic properties. What are the differences between these two kinds of properties? Well, if we're talking about philosophy, and we are, because it's a philosophy class, uh, semantic properties are meaning-involving properties, usually of words, uh, but also of other kinds of expressions. Symbolic expressions like those we find in formal logics, for example. Syntactic properties, on the other hand, are not meaning-involving. So cat and chat are semantically equivalent. They both mean the same thing or refer to the same kind of thing, namely cats. But uh, syntactically, they're not equivalent. Even though they mean the same thing, the symbols we use to represent each of these words are different. So while semantically the same, they're syntactically different. On the other hand, Think of uh, the two different uses of the word bank in English, right? We can have a bank like is in the side of a river, like a river bank, or we can have a bank like the financial institution where you deposit your money. Syntactically, these two uses of the word bank are the same. In English, at any rate, they're spelt with the same letters. They're pronounced the exact same way, but they don't mean the same thing. One refers to the side of a river, and another refers to a financial institution. So those are syntactically equivalent, but semantically distinct. So that's the difference between syntax and semantics. Syntax is about the signs or symbols uh, that are used, and semantics is about what those symbols mean. So those are the two kinds of properties that we need to keep separate in our minds as we explore all of this stuff. Syntactic properties, which are not meaning-involving, and semantic properties, which are meaning-involving. So, what is, the, what is the lesson here? What am I trying to say here? Well, formal logics respect truth, they preserve truth, they respect reason, and preserve meaning, and do all of this really awesome stuff that formal systems do, because they respect syntactic relations, even though they're completely blind to semantic properties. So what I'm trying to say here is that a computer built to operate in such a way to respect uh, or to, to operate only according to syntactic properties will deliver reason respecting outputs even though the computer is, you know, doesn't really know what it's doing, right? Like a pocket calculator doesn't understand what numbers are it doesn't know what the symbols I'm typing into it mean, but it respects the syntactic properties in such a way that if I type two plus two, the calculator will deliver the correct answer, four, even though the calculator doesn't know 
know what 2 or 4 or plus or math is. Similarly, you can, you know, put your fartig together, even if you're not a carpenter and you don't know what a fartig is. It's not a problem. You're like the computer in that sense. That's what I'm going for with this IKEA furniture analogy here. Perhaps a better way to convey these ideas would be uh, via some quotes that you find in chapter one from some pioneers in the fields of artificial intelligence and computer science. Like Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, for example, who write, Logic was a game played with meaningless tokens according to certain purely syntactic rules. Thus, progress was first made by walking away from all that had seemed relevant to meaning and human symbols. Or, as John Hoagland put it, if you take care of the syntax, the semantics takes care of itself. So, I will try and sum all of this up. Uh, logics, logical systems, are formal systems. It doesn't really matter what form the symbols take. You know, they could be symbols in the predicate calculus, they could be zeros and ones, like the machine code of a computer. They could be anything. The symbols just have to be used consistently. And as long as we follow the rules uh, according to which we can, you know, manipulate these symbols, as long as we follow all of the legal moves and use the symbols consistently, the systems will preserve truth and respect reason. They will respect semantics, even though the systems are themselves blind to the semantics. Indeed, it is we human programmers and we human logicians and philosophers who assign the meaning to these symbols. Now, if you think about it, and indeed figures like Newell and Simon certainly did, uh, games like chess are also formal systems. So, you could uh, use a chess analogy here to try and clarify some of this if you're, if you're not quite following this, right? Um, if I wanted to play a game of chess, I could use a traditional chess board, or I could make my own chess board out of paper and I could make little uh, chess figures out of origami or something, right? Or I could use one of those um, novelty chess sets, you know, that has like... Uh, you know, some Star Wars or Star Trek characters or a Game of Thrones chess board. Whatever, it doesn't matter. There's lots of different kinds of chess boards like that. But, you know, it doesn't matter whether we use a, a proper pawn or a proper queen or uh, whether we use, uh, uh, you know, little paper figures. You know, I can have a king... Uh, a normal king from a regular old chess set as my king, or I could have a little figure of Captain Picard as my king. It doesn't matter what the pieces are made of. As long as I follow the rules in the system, I can play chess with that chess set. A nice way of putting this is the way that Clark puts it on page 10. Um, what matters here is, quote, the golden web of moves and transitions, end quote, within the system. And this is also powerful because it makes semantics a little bit less mysterious. At least less mysterious than if we were to take a dualist approach here. Now, this is also still very physicalist, very materialistic, but it's not brute physical, you know. It's not like identity theory or anything. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very physical, it relies on physical processes, but it doesn't matter what the, the, the systems that these processes are realized in are made of. That doesn't matter. Could be a meat machine, could be a digital computer made out of silicon and uh, metal and wires and so forth and lots of different circuits. It doesn't matter what it's made of. What matters is how it functions. Now the next big step after the development of modern logic was the advent of the Turing machine, which I'm sure you've all heard of if you're coming from a cog-sci or philosophy of mind background. I'm going to go over the Turing machine in uh, quite a bit more detail, though, than Clark does in this box, because on the one hand, the Turing machine is just so, so important in the history of cognitive science, or the prehistory of cognitive science, if you like. And on the other hand, because um, the Turing machine is kind of my thing. Now, a Turing machine 
uh, is this imaginary or idealized machine. And it was uh, conceived of by computer scientist Alan Turing. Turing developed this idea as a means of formalizing the notion of computation. And that's kind of like the next step in the history of cognitive science, if you like, after the advent of modern logic. So what was Turing trying to do here? Well, uh, Turing was searching for a solution to the halting problem or the decision problem. So what is the halting problem? Well, the halting problem is the problem of whether or not there is a procedure for determining whether, say, a mathematical problem has a solution. So for example, Computer programs are defined to take certain inputs and not others. So a solution to the halting problem would tell a computer programmer whether, given uh, some specific program and some set of inputs, whether the program is defined for that input. It would tell us whether the computer program would solve uh, you know, whatever problem we were putting to it or whether it would just keep on looping for infinity or something, right? And Turing wanted a kind of mathematical solution to this, a mechanistic solution, if you like. Something like a mathematical formula that you could use to just tell whether a program uh, would halt or whether it would continue on indefinitely. Now, to tackle this problem, Turing borrowed a very, very old idea in mathematics, an idea that goes all the way back to the Middle Ages called the algorithm you know, a set of step-by-step uh, -step instructions, uh, a set of uh, instructions for a procedure, if you like. Perhaps the best way to understand what an algorithm is is as an unambiguous set of rules that we apply to uh, an object or a set of objects. In the case of computation, usually these are symbols, um, in a definite and circumscribed way. Um, so this is the idea that Turing borrowed to make his idea of computation more precise. He thought of computation as something that was rule-governed or algorithmic. So uh, using this idea of the algorithm, Turing conceived of the Turing machine. Of course, he didn't call it that. We call it the Turing machine in his honor. But what it was is was it was an idealized machine. So it's very important to emphasize here that Turing never built a Turing machine. That's not what Turing machines are. Turing machines are imaginary. They're not real. They, uh, they are something that we talk about completely in the abstract, as if they were mathematical machines almost. So a Turing machine has certain parts. Um, it has an infinitely long tape, for example, and it has these cells on the tape. And into the cells, symbols can be typed, uh, they can also be deleted, uh, so on and so forth. So we have an infinitely long tape so that we don't have any storage limitations or anything like that. And we have cells on which we can encode information symbolically. Of course, we also have a machine head. That's what writes on the cells and deletes symbols from cells and moves the tape to the left or the right. A Turing machine also has a little display window, a bit like a computer screen, if you like, which tells us the state that the Turing machine is in. Turing machines also contain machine tables. A machine table uh, is what we would now call a computer program. The machine table is a set of instructions for the Turing machine. So what was the import of Turing machines for helping Turing to address the halting problem? So a Turing machine's behavior is determined solely by the current state of the machine, um, the symbols on the tape, and the instructions in the machine table. So although these Turing machines are imaginary, they gave Turing what he needed to address the halting problem. That is to say that these machines, albeit imaginary, their states, their instructions, everything about them can be represented as a sequence of numbers. Because of this, Turing was actually able to generate mathematical proofs about the properties of Turing machines, which were imaginary computers, essentially. Some of the things that Turing proved were that there exists a special type of Turing machine called a universal Turing machine. 
A universal Turing machine is a Turing machine that can run any specialized Turing machine. For example, if I made a specialized Turing machine that was a calculator, a universal Turing machine could run that Turing machine as well as any other Turing machine. The reason why this is so important is because this is the theoretical precursor to the modern digital computer. That's why this is so important. That is to say, Turing's work here, uh, along with the work of his colleagues and his mentor, Alonzo Church, and others who came after, such as Newell and Seinman and uh, von Neumann and figures like that, uh, Turing's work provided a basis for understanding cognition, that is thinking, as computation. It gave us uh, the kind of theoretical kick in the pants we needed to come up with computationalism. So according to Turing's uh, formulation of these machines, and according to Turing's ideas here, computation is the, mecha the mechanistic uh, rule-governed or algorithmic, if you like, transformation of one set of symbols into another, right? And that's how we understand uh, digital computers today. Uh, input goes in, computation happens, outputs go out. That's computation. Now, I, I'm not sure that Turing actually realized how significant his work was. In later papers, for example, Turing did this work in, I believe it was the 1930s, in a paper published just a few years before he died, uh, called Computing, Machinery, and Intelligence, Turing introduces the Turing test, which is a, a kind of operationalist test designed to answer the question, can machines think? You've probably heard of the Turing test, and we will probably talk about it uh, later on in the class. But for now, all I will say is that Turing didn't really need to come up with this, uh, you know, now it's called the Turing test. He called it the imitation game. Turing really didn't need to do that to answer this question, can machines think? He had already kind of provided a sort of uh, answer to that question. Yes, machines can think. Computing machines can think. Because cognition, thinking, is computation. So machines can think all right. They compute, just like the meat machines in our heads do. Nonetheless, it was because of Turing's work here on what we now call Turing machines and his attempts to address the halting problem that caused people to begin to think of uh, cognition in terms of computation, that is, in terms of information processing. And of course, this is the reason why Turing's work is so important. Turing's work um, gives us a way of formalizing uh, computation, formalizing cognition as computation, which is uh, rule-governed or algorithmic information processing. Turing also subtly proved that there is no solution to the halting problem, by the way, in case you were curious about that. And along with the logician Alonzo Church, who was actually Turing's uh, doctoral supervisor when he was at Princeton, they both showed that any mathematical problem that can be solved algorithmically can also be solved by a Turing machine. Thus, there are universal Turing machines that can compute, uh, well, they can compute anything that's computable. So, following this work from Turing, all of the important theoretical uh, foundations, the basis for classical cognitive science, had pretty much been laid out. There was still some work to be done. Uh, behaviorism was still a thing, and it took a while for cognitive psychology to emerge. And it took until the 1980s for cognitive scientists to actually start paying attention to the brain. There were also developments in linguistics going on in the 1950s uh, that were very much uh, kind of like happening uh, in parallel with some of, the, some of what computer scientists were doing uh, by drawing upon Turing's ideas about algorithmic information processing. In any case, uh, it really just remained to start building such systems, to start building actual computing machines. 
Now, Turing himself had built digital computers. The digital computer was not new uh, when Turing uh, came up with this idea of a Turing machine. Uh, the digital computer uh, goes back to Charles Babbage, right? And that's late 19th century. And Turing also built digital computers as part of his work at Bletchley Park, which was um, a part of uh, Project Ultra. This was the uh, espionage, uh, cryptography uh, stuff going on in the Second World War. Basically, Basically, Turing conceived of and built a computer that allowed code breakers to read the messages, the encrypted messages that the Nazis were using to communicate with one another during the Second World War. And they communicated with an encryption device that uh, the Allied powers called the Enigma machine. And uh, Turing's computer made it possible to crack the code, right? Because these machines had so many different permutations and it was nearly impossible to do this without a computer. So Turing built one that could do this. But of course, the modern architecture of the digital computer actually comes a little bit later. It comes from John von Neumann, who came up with it in the 1930s. Von Neumann was the person who conceived of, of things like the difference between memory and storage and, and this kind of thing, right? In Turing's day, in fact, if you read uh, Turing's work, uh, Turing doesn't differentiate between things like memory and storage, whereas nowadays we all know that um, uh, memory and storage are two different things on a computer, right? At least most of us know that, I think. And these machines, these digital computers, uh, whether they are real or whether they are imaginary, like Turing machines, are a kind of discrete state machine. They can only be in one state at a time because they're digital, right? They're not analog, they're digital. So they need to be in one definite state at a time. And then uh, symbols get transformed according to rules and the machine is in another state and then another state and another state until it's finally moved from input to output. So these discrete state machines, these digital computers, don't need human operators. They only need human programmers. And this is the beginning of artificial intelligence. And what Clark is calling mindware, mindware, is uh, like the software of a digital computer. It's programs, right? Uh, mindware is in the brain like software is in a computer. I suppose I should say that what mindware is to the meat machine, software is to the digital computer. So a lot of the ideas that I've talked about today are captured nicely in something called machine functionalism, which you can read about in box 1.4 in chapter 1. Now, <clears throat> now, remember that substance dualists say that there are two different kinds of stuff. There's physical stuff and there's mental stuff. And the mental stuff explains, uh, you know, our powers of reason, of perception, uh, the phenomenal character of our conscious experience, all of that stuff. But it also introduces a problem, namely the mind-body interaction problem. How does a non-physical mind interact with a physical body? That seems to be kind of an insurmountable problem if we take a dualist approach, and that's why dualism is not very popular. So things started to swing the other way. The pendulum started to swing toward materialism and physicalism. But we don't really want our physicalism to be too physicalist, right? Because then we start to run into other kinds of problems. And we can see this as a philosopher named Hilary Putnam did uh, in something called identity theory. So identity theory is a kind of uh, physical, physicalist, reductive uh, kind of view of the brain, where mental events are just physical events in the brain. So mental states are reducible to physical states. And if you're an eliminative materialist, you would even say we shouldn't even talk about mental states. We should only talk about brain states. So the oft-used example is, uh, you know, to be in pain is to just have your C fibers firing. 
C fibers, by the way, are a type of neuron in the nervous system and they fire, that is they output signals, when we are in physical pain. So to an identity theorist, being in pain is just uh, being in a brain state where your C fibers are firing, right? But Hilary Putnam noticed a little bit of a problem with this. The problem with these identity claims is that if mental states are just brain states, that's the identity claim. Brain states and mental states are identical, thus identity theory. So that's the problem with these claims. If these identity claims raise this problem where uh, if mental states are just brain states, this would seem to rule out creatures with brains that are different than ours uh, experiencing similar mental states. And that's a problem. It's a problem because, uh, for example, there exist animals, right, that have different brains than we do. Right? I think we would all agree that animals are capable of experiencing pain, for example. Especially those with highly developed nervous systems, like mammals, right? I think we all agree that uh, mammals and probably other creatures like reptiles and amphibians and birds and insects, too, uh, experience some kind of pain. But their brains and nervous systems are vastly different than humans. So they can't have the same kind of brain states that we have when we're in pain. So if pain is just identical to having your C fibers firing, then there are many other creatures that it would seem that we would have to rule out them having these kinds of mental states, like being in pain. Incidentally, back in the day, in Descartes' day, it was thought that animals were automatons and that they did not possess a rational soul as humans did. And people used to hold horrible events called uh, cat burnings, where they would place cats in a sack and slowly lower the sack towards a fire and watch the cats scream and try to escape. Uh, these are dualists. I mean, um, I'm not trying to say that all dualists think that animals are soulless automatons. I just think it's interesting that... Um, <laughs> This kind of cat burning nonsense came about at a time when uh, people were also trying to explain uh, human consciousness by appeal to this uh, non-physical soul stuff, right? Of course, uh, perhaps there are other kinds of creatures too, like perhaps there's alien life, right? Like the kind of alien life that uh, couldn't believe that we're just made of meat and that we think with meat and make... Uh, sounds and speech by flapping our meat parts and blowing air through them. If uh, pain is uh, identical with your C fibers firing, then that would rule out the possibility of some other vastly different form of life, like silicon-based life, for example, f having the same kinds of mental states that we do. And Putnam saw that as a problem. So Putnam's solution was functionalism, indeed, machine functionalism, because he was influenced powerfully by Turing's ideas of the Turing machine and computation. And of course, along with functionalism comes the earlier mentioned idea of multiple realizability, right? What matters is not what the system is made of. It doesn't matter if I've got C fires firing, or <laughs> it doesn't matter if I've got C fibers firing, Perhaps I'm an alien and I'm silicon-based rather than carbon-based and I have my A matrices firing uh, or something. I don't know. Or perhaps I'm an animal with a very different brain physiology. Still carbon-based, but my brain's different. But I can still experience pain. So what matters according to Hilary Putnam and according to this view of machine functionalism is that the system fulfills a certain functional description. It has to function in the right kind of way. What is made of, or what the system is made of, doesn't really matter. I can have a real biological heart, or I could have an artificial implant that works as a heart. Or just compare my human heart to the heart of a blue whale, which is vastly huge, and you could, you could drive a Volkswagen Beetle into the heart of a blue whale. But what makes that a heart, and what makes my heart a heart, and what makes an artificial heart a heart, 
is the fact that it pumps blood. It pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs and it pumps reoxygenated blood from the lungs to the body, right? That's what makes it a heart. Similarly, what makes a computing machine a computing machine is that it computes algorithmically. It processes information according to rules. And even though it's blind to the semantic properties of the symbols that make up the system, it respects the syntactic properties. And that's how these systems preserve truth. It's all very, very fascinating if you think about it. All right, everyone, so that is it for our first lecture for this part one of Meat Machines, Mindware as Software. We started off at the end of chapter one by taking a look at They're Made Out of Meat. Again, you can read this in section 1.3 of the book, or better yet, you can take a look at the little short film that I've linked in the video description here. It's very entertaining either way, and I think it really highlights some of the issues that we're up against in this chapter and subsequent chapters in the book, which is no doubt why Clark included it in the book. We've also covered Clark's sketch of the prehistory or history of cognitive science in uh, chapter 1.1. Now, this is by no means exhaustive. For example, in uh, Cognitive Science 2001, a class which I teach sometimes at the Institute of Cognitive Science at Carleton University, we give a much more comprehensive historical survey. I don't have any of those lectures online, but if you have any questions about anything that I've not mentioned here and you want to know how it figures into the history of cognitive science, let me know. I can answer those questions for you. Now, next time, we're going to finish chapter one. We're going to finish Meat Machines, part two. We're going to take a look at the discussion section of chapter one. Now that Clark is done sketching out how powerful and important these ideas are, we're actually going to start critically examining them and questioning them. And that's what makes this a philosophy class, of course. So I hope you've enjoyed this, um, and I just want to remind everybody that if you need to reach out to me to ask me questions, you can send me a message on Discord, you can send me an email, you can leave a question down there in the comment section, or you can even go on See You Learn, where I will have posted uh, a sort of question and answer forum. And you can all talk amongst yourselves there if you have questions for one another that you want to... Uh, say, keep off of YouTube or something, you can talk about them there. So that will be up by the time this lecture goes live. Okay, everyone, that is it for today. I hope you've all enjoyed this uh, initial lecture. Uh, it's very interesting stuff, but by no means exhaustive or comprehensive. And we've only just scratched the surface here, right? So if you're still a little unclear about Turing machines and computationalism and so on and so forth, don't worry. We're going to be talking about this stuff again and again and again as the class unfolds. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, just let me know. All right, so I had better get going to edit this video together so that you have something to watch Tuesday morning. And I'll see you guys next time for our Thursday lecture, which will also be pre-recorded. And I'll have some more announcements coming up soon regarding office hours and things like that. So stay tuned for those announcements as well. So take care of yourselves and I will see you guys next time.